I cannot. I gotta get my Sunday vest on. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Oh, hey! Welcome to Vision Church Online for our Easter Sunday service. I am so glad that you're here. Welcome to all of our Vision family and friends that are tuning in from around the world. And if this is your first time joining us, thank you so much. We are truly blessed that you've decided to worship with us today. Thank you. I'm your host, Corey B., along with my co-host, Kevin, who's out in the field. Uh, we have a great service planned for you today. And before we jump in, I want to make sure no one misses it. So go ahead, like the service, share it if you're watching on Facebook. Uh, maybe start a Facebook watch party. You might be able to uh, connect with some people you haven't connected with in a while, or maybe you just haven't connected with in a church setting before. Um, so it might be a cool way to, uh, to do it. You can also catch us on YouTube or on our website uh, as well. So before we jump in, I want, to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about COVID-19, just real brief. And I want, to, I want to pose a question. I just want to pose one question as we get ready to worship today and, and we posture ourselves to receive God's word and to let him work in our lives. And that question is, how are we doing? For real like let's get real how are we doing take a moment reflect how are you doing how are you dealing with everything your spouse your kids um, I did this exercise with my wife and and there were a lot of things that came from it I'll share one that's kind of funny and, and fits a little bit here is that we bought a lot of puzzles when we when we realized we were going to be quarantined and we have yet to be able to make it through an entire puzzle without losing some pieces See, one, one of our three dogs keeps taking anywhere from two to six pieces of each puzzle, so we haven't been able to finish one. So we get it all done, and then we might have a couple missing pieces here and there. And as I prepared to host the online service today, I, I, I thought a lot about that. And, and here's kind of what, what I was thinking, was that, you know, maybe those missing pieces are kind of like our lives right now. A lot of us have missing pieces to our lives, whether it be, you know, your routine of, of getting up and going to your job, right? Or your kids going to school or sports or whatever it is. We have missing pieces in our lives, just like our puzzles. And maybe for a moment, we just allow God to, to work in those missing pieces. We allow Jesus' love and his un, undying, unwavering, unconditional love fill those pieces for us. So... As we prepare to worship, to get yourself in the right frame of mind, pause, reflect, ask yourself, how are we doing? Ask your spouse, how are we doing? Kids, lean in, lean in, kids. Maybe ask your parents, how are you doing? How are we doing? What can I do to help? It's a big one for them. Might, uh, might get you some extra, extra video game time or something. So, at any rate, as we prepare to worship today, we know it's going to look different. Because we're not getting dressed up in our Sundays. But as we're not going to church, how do we prepare for a Sunday service, an Easter service at home? Well, let's check in with Kevin in the field and see exactly how to do it. Jesus taught that others would know that we are his followers by the way we love one another. That's why at Vision, the week before Easter, we, we call 4919, a week where we intentionally serve and give back to the community. Every year at Vision, at the end of the year, we give a huge offering called Beyond, one-time offering that goes solely to reaching people with the gospel and loving them. And uh, this year's hard because of COVID-19. We weren't able to get out into the streets and be the hands and feet so much. And so we had to get creative and we did. Because of your generosity, we were able to partner with organizations such as the Raleigh Dream Center, Bridge the Gap Min Ministries, uh, Brown Bag Ministries, just to name a few. And, and we partnered with many people and organizations that were feeding uh, children and underprivileged families. We were able to um, give away finan financially to people uh, who had lost their jobs right in our own church and, and bless them. 
Uh, we fed people. We bought people's groceries. We fed hospital workers, veterinarians, um, just to name a few. We gave away gas. Uh, we had a, a local food truck go in a neighborhood and just feed people. And man, isn't it awesome to know that because of your generosity, because you give week in and week out, we are still able to give. Because you give, we give. And man, we are for the 919. And, and I'll just tell you that Jesus Jesus is doing something incredible in the lives of so many people because of your generosity. Thank you for being the church. Uh, as we prepare to show our obedience through our tithes and offerings, let's remember God's generosity in our lives, uh, his forgiveness in our lives, and for his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, God's blessings know no bounds, and our obedience in giving is but a small token of gratitude that we can impart so that the church can love like Jesus in the community and help those in need. Check out this quick clip on how to give and remember, God is good all the time. Just download the app from the App Store, open it up and select the Give icon. Scroll down and you'll see where you can give. It's neat, you can give one time or recurring up to twice a month. You can even select what fund you'd like to give to. Living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day -day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak. Foundations begin to rattle. Our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey. Jesus. The fear is consuming, the worry draining, the doubt painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains.
Isn't it so, so true, church? Mm, those lyrics. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Aren't those lyrics just moving? I know they move me. They, and especially this weekend being Easter weekend, they really seem to sink in. I think it's important that we let those lyrics sink in, especially in a time of reflection. Um, and, we, and we reflect and we acknowledge how God is good to us every single day. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to go into this time of communion a little different than, than normal. But don't lose sight of the symbolism behind it all. And, you know, as we, as we move into this next piece, put your mind at ease in God's words, his commitment to you, his glory, and his grace in your life. Even when you don't see it, it's there, okay? Let's be grateful for all the many blessings and maybe even, you know, those unanswered prayers that we call blessings in disguise. We can be grateful for those too at a time like this. So as our worship team goes into the next song and plays, you'll see a scripture on your screen. I want you to read through it. Let it sink in. Marinate on it for a moment and then follow the prompts. Amazing. That's how I would describe what's happened so far. Um, and, and right now, can you just do me a favor? 
Um, can you comment and just tell our team of volunteers thank you? Like from the musicians uh, to the tech people uh, to the hosts, just can you just say thank you? If you know their names, you can put those up there. Um, just give them some shouts. And it's not about them, but, but kind of it is because without them, without God working in and through them, um, this doesn't happen. And uh, so uh, I want to say thank you too. Um, this has been incredible. You, you know, just been incredible moment of worship, um, giving, uh, communion, everything. And so I'm just really excited about um, what's happening. In fact, if you want to continue to comment, you just put what's been your favorite part so far um, and, and see how it's blessed. And you never know the, the power of a word that God gives you to somebody else. And so happy Easter. Happy Easter. Doesn't it look different? I mean, even this experience is different, right? Easter's the Super Bowl of the Christian faith. It's where people of all, even religions, backgrounds, come together and for one Sunday uh, to celebrate something. Some people come to celebrate uh, Easter bunny, Easter eggs. Some people just like to get dressed up and it's what they're supposed to do. Some people come for the resurrection of Christ, but Easter looks different, doesn't it? Um, and different's not always bad. Uh, I look different today. I am sitting here talking to you through a lens. That's different. I am not dressed up in my Easter apparel. I usually preach in something like this, but for Easter I like to get a little dressy. I guess that's a tradition I have. And so I did, however, get my Easter kicks, my Easter shoes, if you can see those. Uh, colorful, pastel, Easter eggy. So yeah, shout out um, to Nike on those. Um, I'm not pacing back and forth, and I'm, a lot of you like that. I know camera people love it because I've driven them crazy, and um, I, I'm, I'm sitting here with you, um, wherever you are, and I'm excited. I really am excited about this Easter, so here's what I want to do today. I want to just read three verses in Scripture. I want to pray, and then I want to give you a word that I believe God has given me for you at this time. So John chapter 11, beginning in verse one. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary, if you remember this, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Father, I come to you now boldly, asking you to change hearts and lives today, God. This world seems hopelessly broken. No doubt that there are many people who feel hopeless. So today, I pray through your word, through this whole experience, that we see hope in a broken world. I love you. In Christ's name, amen and amen. I want to talk to you today about hope. Hope. And, how, and specifically, how do you maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world? world. How do you do that? Because right now, COVID-19 is, it's killing. It's attacking. It's maybe taking a loved one that you, you know, or a friend, family member. It's taking jobs from people. It's attacked our economy. It's placed fear inside many people's minds and hearts. It's dark. So, how can we have hope during this time? And maybe, maybe you, maybe COVID-19 not really affected you. Like you do a little bit of things differently, but for the most part, that's not what you need hope in. Or hope from. Some of you 
you, you got into a relationship and you got married and you said, I do forever, and your spouse walked out. Your spouse ran around. Your spouse was not who you thought it was. And how do you have hope in that? How are you supposed to have hope in people? Some of you are single and you've been praying or you've been trying and you're 30, 35, 40 years old and you're still single. You've lost hope. Maybe, maybe some of you thought you were going to be big superstars and you had this great athletic ability and all of a sudden you got injured and your scholarship is not there. How do you have hope? You've been diagnosed with the fatal disease or diagnosis. How do you have hope? And what do you hope in? I think in order to answer this question, we have to know what hope is. We've got to define hope. And hope, I, I, here's what I, I wrote down. Hope is the person or thing in which your expectations are centered. These are the things that you trust and that you lean on, lean into. It could be people, it could be your family, it could be sports, it could be money, it could be your profession, it could be your company, it could be your ability, your looks. What is it that you've put your hope in this morning? I like to think of hope as a ladder. It's like a ladder, to be really honest with you. And it's like a ladder that we lean against a wall. And the interesting thing about it is that all of us have this ladder, but none of us remember leaning it on something. And here's what I mean. When we're born, we immediately lean our ladder of hope to our parents, right? Or, or the people who are raising you. You, you, you are hoping for a, a future that they can give you. You are leaning in to your family, leaning into your mom, leaning into your grandma, leaning into your dad. And you put your hope into them, what they can do for you. And pretty soon in life, you figure out, you know what? I need to start making some decisions for myself. I have goals. I have dreams. I have ambitions. I have things I want to do and see happen. And so you take your ladder and you lean it into something else. It may be education. It may be your own logic. It could be money. The things of the world. It could be athletic. It could be anything. But we, throughout the life, we lean our ladder of hope onto different things. This morning, your ladder is leaning on something. It's leaning somewhere. And the truth is, we don't begin to feel hopeless. And we don't even recognize where our ladder is leaning a lot of times until the ladder starts to shake. For many of you, your hope was in your 401k or your investments or the stock market. And as soon as that has been touched, as soon as it starts to crumble, your ladder, you feel it shaking. And it's getting dark. And you're worried. And you're stressed. Some of you have gone to the doctor and gotten news that you didn't expect. And you, your ladder was leaning on your health. It was leaning on what you're going to be doing in five years. And now you you don't even have five months. Now, you were looking forward to retiring, but now with the way the world is and your money situation, your ladder shaking. Where's your ladder leaning this morning? Because it's only, it's only when we begin to experience the free fall. It, it, only when we bump up against the tension of how do I remain hopeful? How do I keep going? How, how is it going to keep working? It's only then that we realize that maybe we've leaned our ladder onto something that can't hold us. We've all got a ladder of hope today. How do we maintain this hope in a world that's hopelessly broken? Now, 
course, you've already got the answer. You know me, I'm a pastor. So what am I going to say? Lean your ladder on the Lord, right? And, and that's right. All throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll see um, where we are supposed to place our hope and our trust in God. That is 100% accurate. But can I get real with you? Saying that's easy. Doing it, it's tough. It's tough. Because even as a follower of Jesus, do you find yourself like me trying to do things in order to keep God okay or happy or pleased with you? Like to, just to make sure that he doesn't yank the ladder out from under you? Like, maybe you, you, you started thinking, I need to get back to church, because church is what's going to make me okay. I need to pray more, because praying is going to make me right with God. Maybe if I start giving, then God will give me. You know, I, I need to start serving other people, because that's what Jesus did. He served, so I need to be okay like Jesus. I need, I need to do more. If I do more, then, God, then, then my ladder will be good. Because we don't want to make it slip. So here's what we do. We pray these prayers. And, and, and it's really a prayer of God, don't make my ladder fall. Just don't make it fall. God, please, please, God, I am, I'm venturing out and I'm going to go with this company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest here, God. I'm trusting you with it. Please don't let it fail. That's what we're saying. Don't let, don't let the ladder fall, God. And, and God, Lord, I really like this person. Please let them call me. Please let it be the one. Right. And what we're saying is, I love you, God. I trust you, God. But I'm also afraid you're going to pull that ladder out from me. My hope. We live in a hopelessly broken world, don't we? We could try to invest, and we could try to plan, and we could try to prepare, and we can get a great education and puff up knowledge inside. But at some point, and maybe it's today for you, you realize that nothing in this life, nothing in this world is secure enough to hold your ladder of hope. Nothing. I mean, some of you are watching right now that have lost, lost loved ones in the last year. And it's killed you. You, you. You're not even the same person. Because your hope was in them. And it's hard. And at that moment, when the, the pressure's mounted, and the stakes are high, and it's a life or death situation, and it's dark, and, and you're in despair, how in the world do you have hope when it looks like there's no way out? In our passage today, in John chapter 11, this is Mary and Martha. They find themselves in this type of situation. It is dark and death is knocking. Their little brother Lazarus is ill and he is dying. He is moments away from passing on. And they love him. And they don't want to lose him. And it looks hopeless. And, and they get this idea because Jesus is not there. Maybe that's a word for you today. <laughs> Maybe you're in a situation that it looks dark right now and it looks like Jesus isn't there. But, but they find out that he's just several miles down the road and he, he's really easy to get to. And so today's standard, what we would do if we found out that we needed somebody a couple, we'd call them on the phone or we'd go and get an Uber. Um, we'd hop into our Prius I keep saying Prius. I don't know why Prius. Uh, Prius, Prius. I don't think pastors should drive Priuses, but, but that's neither here nor there. Um, anyway, they, they don't have access to that back then. Mary and Martha, what do they have to do? They have to take pen to paper. They have to write a note because they need Jesus to come heal. They need Jesus to come save and deliver. And so verse 3 says, The sisters sent to him, saying. That means they got a runner. A runner is a person that would take the letter and, and, and send it and to the person that it needed to go to. So, so they wrote this note, and they give the note to the runner. The runner would take it to Jesus, and Jesus would read the note, and whatever's in that note has to be good enough 
to wow Jesus. It's got to be something that Jesus goes, oh my gosh, I've got to go. Stops everything, drops it, and runs back to Lazarus. That's how good the note needs to be. If you had one note that you could write that would save your brother's life, that would save your sister's life, that would save your spouse's life, the person you care about the most, you got one chance to get God's attention to come and save him, to come and heal him. What would you write? You ever think about that? Think about it. What would you write? If, I, if my wife, Mandy, if she was on her deathbed, and I knew that I could write one note to God to save her, I would beg God, beg God to come and heal her. Because, because she's Mandy. She loves God. And she serves God. And she leads the women at the church. And she pours into people. And she's an amazing mother. And I can't do this parenting thing without her. She makes me better. She holds me accountable. And God, don't take her. Don't take her. I would, I would beg God. I'd write that in the note. That's not what we see Mary and Martha writing. It's really ridiculously fascinating if you look at it because if I'm Mary and Martha, I'm saying, Lord, Lazarus, the one who loves you, Lazarus, the one who has given his life to you, Lazarus, the one who serves you and worships you, the, the one who spends time with you, God, the one who talks just amazingly about you. He's really nice to the senior citizens down the road in our community. He helps out. He serves others. That Lazarus, he is dying and he needs you to come now. Please come and save his life. That's what I'm writing. But that's not what it says. Look at, look at scripture. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Isn't it interesting that Mary and Martha, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of a hopeless situation, in the midst of death, conclude that what will get Jesus to come and heal Lazarus is not reminding Jesus of Lazarus' love for him, but reminding Jesus of his love. For Lazarus. Let me tell you today's big idea. I always, if you know me, then I always like to have one big idea that you lean on. Here it is. Following Jesus is more about his love for you than your love for him. Following Jesus is more about his love for you than your love for him. When I hear that, think how much of my life, how, how much of my following Jesus have I made about what I do for him? If I get my prayer life right, if I serve right, if I love him more, my performance improves. Basically what I'm doing is improving a spiritual resume. But here, but here, in a pressure situation, in a dire moment, in a matter of life and death, what seems to surface in Mary and Martha's heart is not how much Lazarus has done for Jesus and how much Lazarus loves Jesus. It's how much Jesus loves Lazarus. I mean, could it be that the Bible is not so much about us as it is about God's love for you? I mean, could it be that we've got this Christianity thing wrong? If you study scripture, if you look through the, the Old Testament, New, Te New Testament, if you look in the New Testament at Jesus' life, you will find other than his earthly parents, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were intimately close with him. In fact, the second to last week of his life was spent solely with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I mean, they were close to Jesus. 
And there's a theme in the New Testament that the closer, those closest with Jesus seem more preoccupied with Jesus' love for them than they do for, with their love for Jesus. I mean, you, you think about John. You ever heard of John the disciple? See, Peter, so Jesus had 12 disciples that he poured into, but he also had these inner three, Peter, James, and John. This is the John I'm talking about, John. And John, when Jesus was talking about his death and him going away, John's the one leaning on Jesus. I mean, John is close to Jesus, intimate with Jesus. But i got to be honest, John does something that I think is arrogant, cocky, almost rude. He gives himself a nickname. Disclaimer, if that's you and you've given yourself a nickname, that's just awkward. Like, you don't need to call yourself whoever you call yourself. But John, John, he gives himself a nickname and calls himself, check this out, the disciple whom Jesus loves. And he calls himself this five times. Hey, boys, it's me, John. I'm... You know, you know me, the one that Jesus loves. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I, I, can you imagine if I introduced myself to you this way? Hey, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Hey, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor that Jesus loves. <laughs> how would you respond? Don't comment below. But you, you would say that arrogant punk, that young buck, prima donna, what's he doing? I mean, there's no way this could be okay, right? John, are you, are you actually saying that you're God's favorite? I mean, how dare you? But listen, five times in the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God, five times, God watches John pen these words, the disciple whom Jesus loves. And it's as if God is saying, yep, I'm inspiring him to write that. Yes, you are the disciple whom I love. Do you, do you understand this? Like when, we, when we grasp this, this should cause us to step back. This ridiculously extravagant love of God. I, it's incredible. I mean, John 3.16 John 3.16. Do you know John 3.16? Most people know John 3.16. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church or not. Um, it, it, Tim, Tim Tebow made it even more famous. You know, he's putting it under his eyes, and he didn't write it. Um, it's in the Bible. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. When I look at the world... When I see Christians, even churches today, it, it, it's like we've read John 3.16 as the world has so loved God that he gave his only begotten son. Preachers, pastors, churches, Christians, we get this wrong. We preach, we teach, we live our life as if, if, if we do more, if I love God more, if I give more, then God will love me more. And God will bless me more. If I go to church, if I do these things, if I live for him, if I don't sin. But the Bible, the Bible says something different. It says, for God so loved that he gave. It has nothing to do with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now don't miss this. The world the world. When, when you hear that, you probably think of the globe or you think of all people, and, and that's okay. But the world in the original language, that meant sinful system. For God so loved the sinful... For God loves bad people? Sinners? God loves bad people? And not just loves bad people. He so loved bad people. So ridiculously loves us. You ever, you ever see those parents at, at sporting events at rec leagues? And they're decked out in their 
son or daughter's uniform and the colors and they're going crazy on the sidelines, running up and down, filming every game. And they don't post a lot, but after the game, they've posted Johnny's stats. He hit two home runs, the game-winning RBI. He's the MVP. And, and Johnny's three years old. Three, three years old. But they so love Johnny. They were all into what Johnny was doing. That doesn't even begin to compare to the way God so loves bad people. And newsflash, he can't stop. He will not stop loving bad people. He is love. So for him to stop would be him denying himself, him denying his character, and he can't do that. He is love. He will not stop loving you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, no matter what you do, no matter if you accept it or not, God will not stop relentlessly loving you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that's you, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember in Luke 5, Peter and the boys, they were fishing, they didn't catch anything, and Jesus says, hey, go a little bit deeper, go out there, and, and fill, throw your nets down. And Peter's like, ah, Lord, we've been fishing, I, I just don't know, and, but I'll do it. And so he goes out there, man, sure enough, the boat is overflowing with fish, and it's on the verge of sinking, and Peter's just, do you remember Peter's response in that moment? Peter looks at Jesus and says, Leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Peter said, God, you've got to go. I can't be around you. Don't, Lord, you can't bless me like this because I can't live up to what you're asking me to do. I can't be who you want me to be. Why, why, does Peter, why does Peter say that? Why, why does he think like that? The truth is, that's what we think like. You think about relationships in your life. They're two-way, aren't they? We, we act and believe as if you hold up your end of the relationship and I'll hold up my end. Don't let down, because I'm going to hold up my end. And if we're honest... That's how we view our relationship with God a lot of times. We believe God is waiting for us to hold up our end of the relationship. So when God fills up the boat with fish, Peter realizes, I can't do this. There's no way I can keep up my end of the relationship. You can't bless me this much. You can't love me this much because I can't give it back. So Peter says, you got to go because I'm sinful and I'm disgusting and I'm going to fail. And, and you can't love me because I won't love you back like this. Let me help you out. That's not the gospel though. See, God understood that humanity would never be able to hold up their end of the relationship with him. No matter how hard we try, we'll never be able to hold it up. And so he sent his son to do what you can't do. To say, I'm here. And I'll hold up your relationship, into the relationship. And now, listen, if we simply lean our ladder into Jesus, we trust in Jesus, into God's son, then our end of the relationship with him is upheld now for all eternity. We got to let our ladder go and lean it into Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Not your job, 
not your status. N Listen, Christian, not your talents and abilities. You've got to lean into Jesus. And for those of you thinking, I'm just, I'm not good enough. Listen, Peter. God will never stop loving you. God will never turn you away. Whether you accept it, whether you reject it, whether you ever acknowledge it, God will never stop loving you, pursuing you. He is for you. He is toward you. God so loves you. That's the Easter message. 1 John 4.10, it says, In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word, propitiation. Think, um, think substitute. That Jesus took your place. He subbed in for you. He paid the penalty. He paid your price. He held up your end of the relationship and now you have a responsibility whether you lean your ladder on him or not the choice is yours but if you do that's how you find hope in a hopelessly broken world
And I just want to say right now that as you are watching this and listening and you've heard amazing worship music and a message, maybe right now you understand that I live in hope. Maybe right now you're, you feel God tugging on you because you've been hopeless right now. And I just want to, I want to pray this with you. If that's you and you feel hopeless and you know that God has drawn you, then, then just say this prayer with me. Say, Father, I know that I need you. I am longing for something and I've been trying so hard. And I know that Jesus is the living hope. Father, I turn from my sin right where I am and I come running to you give me new life I believe that Jesus came and died for my sins and as my sins and I believe that he miraculously rose again to save me so today, I trust you with my life. In Christ's name, amen and amen. If you've taken the next step today, then I invite you to reach out to us, private message us, email us, and let us know. We're so excited that God is working. you to now receive a blessing that this group of people they're going to sing about God's blessing in your life I believe this is what what many people have been and are praying for you right now that your children and their children and generations to come would know the living hope of Jesus Christ so Let's worship together.
to our worship team. Thank you guys so much for all your hard work this week to bring the gospel to our living rooms. It's truly amazing. Thank you to Devin and Megan for stepping in and helping us out. We can't thank you enough. Um, we hope that God has spoken to you today. And if you were impacted by today's message and would like to take your next steps, or perhaps you'd just like to uh, speak with someone to know what the next steps might look like for you, let us know. Uh, comment below, send us a direct message, you can email us, give us a call, and we'll be sure to have one of our church members get in touch to help navigate through that. Uh, I do want to remind you, today, 4 p.m., we have Easter Jam going on. Uh, you can tune in here on Facebook, on our YouTube channel, and you know, if you just, you're not sure, let me know. I'll make sure that you have the link and, and we get you connected. It's going to be a great, great time of worship. Again, 4 p.m. for our Easter Jam. Hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. That's our show. I'm your host, Corey B. And on behalf of my co-host, Kevin, and Vision Church, I want to remind you, Jesus loves you. We love you. Go out there this week and be the church. Or stay in this week and be the church. All right, buddy? Safe to say he's not going anywhere. All right. What does Easter mean to you? Ooh, um, let's see. It means remembering that Jesus died for us and that he had a very painful death. And that I, when I really think about that, I just am so thankful that he went through all of that pain and suffering for me and everyone um and then that there is a time then we get to remember that he did rise again and all the goodness that came from that i guess awesome. What does Easter mean to you? So as mind blowing as it is that a friend of mine told me earlier that you can roast peeps, roasted peeps, creme, uh, creme brulee peeps, as mind blowing as that is. The, the thing about Easter for me, the, what it means to me is that there's hope for uh, suffering in the face of suffering and evil in the world. Evil is not a good thing. Suffering is not a happy thing or something that we want to go through. But there can be redemption in the face of it. So Easter for me is hope of a resurrection. Awesome. Great. Great point, man. I appreciate that. Um, we appreciate you helping. But yes, if you have never done it before, Ladies and gentlemen, you absolutely need to be taking, particularly in my in my experience, the blue ones. I don't know what it is about the blue sugar versus the pink sugar, but to me, they seem to taste better. But you, you can't burn them. You can't there's, score there's them. definitely a science to it. Yeah, you can't you can't burn them like you burn regular marshmallows because you burn burnt sugar in case you've never ate it before it does not taste good. But just just a light brown. There you go. Caramelized sugar, on the other hand, is fantastic. Can't wait to try it. It's crunchy. Mind blown. It's crunchy, man. When you bite it, it's crunchy. It's awesome. And the marshmallows melted underneath. Got to do it. You need to do it tonight. Like you need to go out on your back porch or in your backyard, create a bonfire, and roast some peas. I'll get right on. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye.